Hey there. I recently finished teaching a course for Davenant Hall called The Church in Medieval England, and it was a really great time. One of the recurring themes that comes up when you teach that sort of a Christian history or ecclesiastical history or history of Christianity or whatever we call it these days, course, is the relationship between secular princes, well, Christian princes, and the church. Right, so you get all sorts of amazing things come up in there. So I'd be, I've been meaning to make this video sort of as a while for a while as a result of teaching about that, specifically after the week when I talked about the investiture controversy. And so I thought that today I would initiate you into the world of church and state when everyone is theoretically a Christian, or maybe not when everybody's a Christian, because you know where we're going to begin. We're going to begin with Constantine. And we're probably going to take things from Constantine all the way to Henry VIII. I'm Henry the Eighth, I am. Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. I got married to the widow next door. She's been married seven times before. And everyone was an Anna Ray, Anna Ray. She wouldn't have a Willie or a Sam. I'm her, I'm her eighth old man. I'm Henry. Henry the Eighth, I am. So first, since the investiture controversy is the, um, initiating event for this discussion what is investiture investiture and what is the controversy what do what should you care about i don't actually know if you should care about investiture i'm not actually going to be making all sorts of applications of the principles of ancient and medieval relationships between christian princes and the christian church i'm just going to talk about a lot of stuff um and we're going to see where this video is going to end up going. So what is investiture? Well, in the medieval church, uh, after you sort of had your bishop consecrated, you know, the laying on hands with the three approving bishops, at least according to the canons of Nicaea, then you would be invested with the symbols of office, a ring, the Episcopal ring, and then the shepherd's crook, you know, the staff. And, you know, we've seen some of these with their fancy carved ivory heads, like the one reputed to be that of Pope St. Gregory the Great that I kissed one time. Uh, it's not actually Gregory the Gates, I kissed it anyway. So there. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so you have this um, investing of this authority. And then, however, in the Middle Ages, a further thing is invested, which is the investing of temporal authority, because a lot of bishops also held um, they had a job in the secular sphere as well. They were landowners, they did all sorts of things, um, and so they would be handed perhaps a staff or rod of office um, by somebody. And it's the somebody that is the controversy in the investiture controversy. So for example, well, no, not for example. So basically what ends up happening is um, kings think, or emperors, um, such as the German emperors, think that they should be doing all the investing. They'd be like, you know what? It is part of my duty as a Christian prince to make sure that I have good and sound bishops um, governing the church within my realm. It is part of my spiritual duty as a Christian prince to look out for the spiritual well-being of the population of my realm. Therefore, it seems only logical that I should be investing them with uh, these symbols of their office. But the difficulty that arises is in an ancient pre-modern, let's say, mindset, as you know, you've seen some of my symbolism related videos, perhaps, if you're here today, is that investing someone with something isn't just a symbolic action. It, the symbol is the thing. Symbolically doing something does the thing that is meant to be done. So like the king isn't the king until he's been crowned and anointed, until the coronation, which is why upon the death of Edward the Confessor, um, Harold Godwinson got himself anointed and crowned by the Archbishop of York as quickly as possible, because it is the ceremony of the crowning that makes you into the king and the anointing. And it was the Archbishop of York because Stigand was an illegitimate Archbishop of Canterbury because he never abandoned being Bishop of Winchester. 
That's a different story. Or, for example, in the medieval world, you're not really a knight until you've had whichever ceremony is customary in your uh, sphere to become a knight, such as the buckling on of the sword. And so, for example, in Lancelot du Lac, uh, Sir Lancelot is never actually... He wants Queen Guinevere to buckle on his sword. Uh, she wants... He wants her to do that so that he will have been made a knight by her. And so he's not really a knight until the ceremony has occurred. The ceremony actually does the thing. The ceremony is not just, you know, something that you do because it's a ritual and it feels good or whatever. The ceremonial act does what is necessary. I'll give you a third example because it came to mind and it's relevant here. A third example is actually a late antique example from the Council of Ephesus, where there's a letter that the Emperor Theodosius II um, had his commissioner um, was to recite and the recitation of the letter opens the council. And so Cyril makes the commissioner read this letter out loud and thus the council starts even though they were not doing what the letter said. Because it wasn't the content of the letter that mattered in terms of opening the council. It was having the letter read out. The council of Ephesus is admittedly a bit wild and crazy. One of the wildest and craziest of all of the ancient councils. So anyway, so these are examples of how a symbolic act is the thing itself. And so investiture, if the king is giving you this, the office, well, if he's giving you the objects that are the symbols of your spiritual authority, the ring and the shepherd's crook, that says that regardless of the three bishops, or wh however it ends up working under the Kansas of Nicaea, three bishops. So we're going to pretend like that's there. Regardless of the three bishops, regardless of the authorization of your metropolitan bishop, the investing being done by the king says that it is the king who is giving you this spiritual authority. And a lot of people, like the Pope and Anselm of Canterbury, say, no, no, no. That's not part of the king's job. Also, you can't pay the king a sum of money either because you can't buy office from anyone. And certainly buying church office is called simony after Simon Magnus, Magus. So anyway, so that's sort of what's going on with investiture. And the emperors uh, really, really wanted this, the German emperors. And so like there were wars, there were actual wars fought over the right to investiture in the 1100s, the right of doing the investing. And so finally it was determined, it was determined uh, by the Concordat of Worms. I actually have notes here for this because there are lots of things going on in uh, 1121, I believe. Did put that one down. Um, in the Concordat of Worms, it was determined that the Holy Roman Emperor was no longer going to could do any of the investing of the bishops. He could still be involved in the selection of the bishops, but that there should be free elections first and foremost. That is the ancient thing. Bishops aren't meant to be appointed by the Pope. And under the ancient structure, they're not meant to be appointed by the Queen or the Prime Minister. Uh, <clears throat> they're in order to be selected by a committee. Um, they're to be elected in a free election of the clergy and the laity, and then if it's for an archbishop, the, the rest of the local bishops. That's one of the Nicene canons, is that you get um, a majority, or indeed, preferably, a unanimous consensus from all of the bishops of a region to choose a fellow bishop or to choose their metropolitan bishop. And that's the way it is theoretically meant to go. And remember that the Nicene canons that I keep citing are, th because it's an ecumenical council, meant to be binding throughout the Middle Ages and are therefore theoretically they're on the books for the Eastern Orthodox now. Um, I don't know that they're on the books anymore for the Anglicans, and they're not under the, on the books for the Roman Catholics because they redid everything with two codes of canon law in the 20th century or something insane like that. So, but the Nicene canons, canons for, also for the Church of the East and the different and the Oriental Orthodox communion, furthermore. That's how you do it. You, you elect the local bishop. That's how Pope St. Leo the Great, who I did my PhD on, um, that's how he says you're supposed to pick a bishop too, is that the laity, the, the local leading guys, and the clergy all choose the local bishop together. And then from there you get three um, local bishops to do the consecration, cons consecrating of him when you have the, the approval of the Metropolitan. All of that basically is in the canons of the Council of Nicaea from 325. <clears throat> and so then 
if that's how you choose a bishop, so what the Concord of Vat of Form says is, amongst the major magnates that are talked of often in the ancient documents, um, who helped choose, the, the king should be involved in the process. But of course, a lot of kings, like Henry I, would let the bishops do their own thing. Um, other kings like Henry II wouldn't. Look how that went for him. <clears throat> so, uh, so anyway, so this is just, just what's going on with the investiture controversy. So, and as a result of that, um, this is um, the Concordat of Worms, and it sort of becomes the status quo um, for everyone after that, especially at the first after the first Lateran Council of 1123. Then, as a result, sort of the idea is that the local prince is involved. Um, and he might he gets to do tie breaking as well. Gets to be a tiebreaker. That's a that's a big job. But that um, moving on from from then forward, it's an internal matter um, of the clerics to choose um, bishops and or of, of of the whole church. That the king doesn't um, get to just appoint bishops as he wishes and as he pleases willy nilly. Seems pretty straightforward. Seems pretty straightforward. Well, I have lots of things that I really wanted to talk about originally, but there's some crazy stuff that goes down under King John in England, let me tell you. King John just blows it all out of the water because, you know, he is possibly the worst king in English history. And King John decides that he is not going to accept the choice of the bishops, of the bishops, of the monks um, of Christ Church Canterbury, which is traditionally how you choose the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and so this, and he puts forward his own guy, and thus there, this is not the first time this sort of thing has happened, but usually it's not just the king alone, you have like a gathering of the bishops and everyone. And this is going on for months, and so then Pope Innocent III says, well here's the third guy, Stephen Langton, he's going to be Archbishop of Canterbury. And John says, I don't think so. And so then the Pope says, well then, we're just going to lay an interdict on England. And King John says, yeah well, still not going to accept Stephen Langton. And so then it's the interdict lasts something like three years. It's insane. It's ridiculous. Eventually, when the Pope decides he's going to depose King John, honestly, that must have been the King of France's favorite days when he's told he gets to go and tell King John he's deposed from being King of England, John relents, relents and lets Stephen Langton come and be Archbishop of Canterbury, the choice of the Pope. So this is sort of a... Whoo, there you go, oh my goodness, in the 12, early 1200s, the Pope is doing this. And not only that, though, John, in order to retain uh, the monarchy of the Kingdom of England, turns England into a fief of the Pope. And that's just insane. Who, I don't even, I don't know where to go from that. But then it is later on used, when Stephen Langton um, is one of the chief arch architects of Magna Carta, the fact that John is a fief of the Pope is actually able to use that to under undermine undermine Magna Carta and so it is not actually until his son that Magna Carta actually becomes law anyway so but Stephen Langton then comes and he's the Pope's man but what does he spend um, his time doing after he's done antagonizing the king is antagonize the Pope in fact Stephen Langton fights for local rights in England and so this is the story from the 1200s through to the end of the Middle Ages through to Henry VIII is gathering local power within the kingdom that one of the problems that sort of has arisen by the time of Innocent III and that these pe people like Langton are fighting against people, Robert Gross test as well, contemporary of Langton's, is the fact that unsuitable persons are being appointed to um, pastoral work. And so you have churches full of people who are just not, no, just should not be there. And so they want these people to be replaced. Um, but the Pope is able to make all these appointments. And so over time, and then especially under Edward III, um, over time they're able to claw back this power um, from the Pope and give it back to the people. And the, the person with the most power to be able to do this is the king. And so it's actually kind of funny. The whole business of the investiture controversy, um, that's over. But the king still is able to do the power part. So he no longer has the symbolic role that makes the thing happen, but the person who is being invested in England at pretty much any given time by the end of the reign of Edward III, 1377, is the king's man. That archbishops and bishops and clerks of um, lower orders, like priests, really, like 
are being appointed by the king, or at least their appointments are being approved by the king. So they're being chosen by the monarch and by the secular um, ruler, not um, being appointed by the pope, nor perhaps necessarily always being elected by the people in the sort of late antique fashion that I was speaking about earlier. And so this is pretty crazy, but what, why on earth, what are these princes doing in the Middle Ages? Why are these kings running around meddling in the affairs of the church? Why are they contravening the sacred boundary between church and state? I would like to see, there is no such thing as the boundary between church and state. There is no such thing as the state. That's right. I said it. There's no such thing as the state in the, in the ancient and medieval worlds. And what I mean by that is, well, I mean all sorts of things by that, but basically you have a, you have a variety of kingdoms and you have people who rule them and they take care of the people who live within the borders of the, of the kingdom or whatever republic, I suppose, if it's Venice, uh, that to which has been entrusted to them by divine right or the will of the people or whatever. So we have all these different polities scattered around medieval Europe that have their different sorts of governing schemes, but they, they don't, I don't think that they think of themselves as being a, as though there's something called the state that is over top of the people. You have the politics from which the people come together into um, the polis or the super polis of what we might think of as a natio, perhaps, I don't know. Um, so, but this division between church and state, that's, that's a weird kind of idea, in fact, um, that even the Reformation was not over fond of. So, but how this, this world between the secular, there is possibly a world of secular and sacred though. And the king is, seems to have primarily a secular role. So why is he, why do they think they're able to transgress or are they transgressing? Why do they think they're able to operate within the, the sacred as well is the real question, not church state. So what is going on there? That is a very good question. And this goes back to Constantine. As I said, we would talk about him. Constantine um, considers himself basically the bishop of the bishops. Um, he is, in fact, he's even called Is Apostolos, equal to the apostles because of the things that he did during his reign. Um, and so he, when he comes, he claims, and I see no reason to doubt his claims, who cares about setting aside all sorts of other questions. Everyone wants to question the man's sincerity and I'm not here to do that. He wants to have a church that is united and at peace with itself. I see no reason to doubt that. We might doubt all sorts of other things about him, but that that's the thing that he wants actually makes sense because he's a Roman emperor. That's the kind of thing you would expect any Roman emperor, Christian or pagan to want, is a stable religious institution. And so he's thrown his lot in with the Christian religious institution and the God of the Christians and the church, which is the institution of the Christian religion. And so he comes in and he wants to see them at peace, right? And well, what does he do? Well, he, first of all, he actually, he tries to get people together in their little councils, right? So Council of Ars, Council of Rome to deal with Donatism. And then he gets people together at the Council of Nicaea to deal with Arianism, Miletianism, the date of Easter, and then a variety of other canonical um, canon law questions, right? There are, there's a series of Nicene canons. I have spoken about them quite a bit today. So Constantine gets these all these people together. But what's interesting, if you read Constantine's letter on the date of Easter, is that that's where he says, oh, I, it is, you know, God has been favoring us, as you can see from the prosperity of the empire. Also, therefore, I want the church to be at peace. So we call this council, la di da di da talks about all this stuff about the date of Easter. Different story, interesting story, different story, though. And then towards the end, he says that, therefore, um, I am doing what the bishops say, and when all these bishops have gathered together in harmony and have come to an agreement, that is the divine will. Dude actually says that, right? And so I think one of the important nuances to whatever Constantine is doing with his religious policy is that he enforces the decision of the bishops at council. And so it is clear from all sorts of things that the man does that he is not necessarily that sympathetic actually to the Nicene Creed. I'm not saying like he's an Ariomaniac to use the term from St. Athanasius, but I am saying that he's not necessarily sympathetic to the pro-Nicenes, but he is sympathetic to a bunch of bishops in council and he's sympathetic to finding stability. And so he enforces the creed of Nicaea through a desire for stability. And I don't want to argue with him in the comments about that. All right. Um, the bishops freely choose 
the way the wording that they think is best for what uh, is the Orthodox Christian faith. This is not imposed by the emperor. These are the bishops who have been freely elected by the people of their own dioceses with a free hand in council to determine what is the best way to articulate the apostolic truth that has been comes down to them um, through the scriptures and through the tradition. And that's what they do. Constantine simply enforces what the bishops have already decided in council. I'm serious about this. This is the actual thing that happened at the Council of Nicaea. You screw Constantine at a certain level. Anyway, so he enforces that. Um, and then after that, though, Constantine has set a precedent, right? There's also a possibility that he closes the temples. Um, the evidence for that is scattered, and I haven't reviewed it in too many years. So, but anyway, so this is the Constantinian thing. And to sort of do a garbled view of it that takes into account some of the ideas of the Reformation, he is, there is a priesthood of all believers, even if we accept the traditional hierarchy that you find, you know, in the description of the Church of Rome under Cornelius, um, from like porters up to the bishop, we accept that this hierarchy exists and that these people have been prayed over and they've had hands laid on them and they have been anointed and chosen for the spiritual good of the people. It is nonetheless the case that God also has the laity and they have their own hierarchy that he has placed for the ordering of society. And if you have lay people who are people who hold positions of power, um, and you are a Christian, do you, it, it does it not make sense that perhaps you would want them to lend their power to the right ordering of the church. And if you are a lay prince, you if you are a Constantine, or you are a Justinian, you are a Charlemagne, you are a Alfred the Great, you are William the Conqueror, you are Henry the Eighth, Edward the Sixth, Elizabeth, first or second. You want to see the right ordering and spiritual health of your realm that has been entrusted to you by the power of God. Right? So this is what Constantine is doing. And you are a member of that church. You are a member of the church. And so that means that you have a voice within what goes on in the church anyway. Wouldn't it make sense for you to be involved in trying to find um, strong, holy, orthodox leaders for the realm that has been entrusted to you? Would you not be a dereliction of duty if you paid no attention to that at all? And so that's what people like Constantine are up to. And it's not always that bad. I mean, this is, but which is the problem? There is a big problem, of course, with this. It is one thing to be like, oh, Constantine's just going to do whatever the bishops say. And then you go along for, for a few generations, did a little lump. We got the 480s. We've got Gelasius, Bishop of Rome. And he is not interested in anything that the Emperor Anastasius has to say and uh, or the Bishop of Constantinople in as much as they are promoting what Pope Gelasius considers heresy. So here we come with our, one of our first blockades to this problem. Well, what do you do when the secular prince allies himself with a bishop to promote heresy and you are another bishop? Um, all of a sudden you start thinking perhaps there actually are two spheres here. And so that's part of the story. This is part of the story, especially of how it ends up playing out in the West, is that because of the Acacian Schism, where Acacius of Constantinople was doing things like admitting Peter Mongus and some other of the anti-Chalcedonian party into communion with him and promoting a statement of faith called the Henoticon, which um, basically sidesteps Chalcedon and is a little bit hairy and, and, and blurry as to what orthodoxy is, um, which of course is never going to satisfy anyone. As Athanasius points out in his some of his anti-Aryan writings, so yeah, you can get all these Arians to say things that are orthodox, but can you get them to deny the heresies that they've already professed previously. This is the big question. Anyway, so you've got all these things going on. And so Gelasius, agree with either side of this, I don't know, but this is how the history plays itself out. Gelasius sort of articulates what comes to be, th be sort of like the doctrine Gelasian, um, the doctrine, the Gelasian doctrine of the two powers. And this is a very Western approach, thence forward um, to ecclesiastical history, that Princes are there to support the bishops, so the bishops make all the decisions, basically. That's the way, um, at least the popes and their allies are going to articulate it. And so later on, um, and we get to the reign of Justinian, and there are all sorts of amazing things to talk about during the reign of Justinian. Justinian himself, though, 
is not a bad theologian. Uh, he's clearly a reader of Leontius of, Biet of Byzantium, and uh, he cr crafts his own theological treatises and his own laws in the realm of theology and ecclesiastical politics, and he calls a church council that does whatever he wants. And a lot of people are not happy with that, with some of the, his policies. And so what you do, once again, this time it's something it's like the emperor himself is the theologian who's at fault if you're opposed to him. And But even then, it's actually, well, his actual teachings are themselves not heretical. I don't think his, his opponents would say that. They would say that he's overstepping the reach and boundaries of what the king, the monarch, the emperor, is allowed to do as a, as a prince. It should be the bishops and council, and then he enforces what the bishops decide, not the emperor alone with his advisors who enforcing what the emperor decides. And so that's part of the problem that goes on in Justinian. And an interesting document collection that comes out of that era is the Collectio Avalana, and I think that this actually speaks largely to this question because there are a good number of this, of the documents in this collection are letters that are basically sort of like um, Honorius writing to Arcadius, telling uh, Honorius is a Roman emperor and of the West and his brother is Arcadius. This is like the time when East and West accidentally became two separate empires, basically. And he says to Arcadius, hey, what do you think you're doing? Um, deposing the exiling Bishop John Chrysostom, that's not your job. You are interfering in the life of the church, right? So you have this Western view is already there in um, sort of the early 400s. And then people in the 500s find it really interesting and are gathering it when they're living under Justinian, whom a lot of people in the West felt was overstepping his boundaries. Nonetheless, the idea of the prince as tiebreaker, like in the Concordat of Worms, is still there because Around the same time as all of this is happening, there is a disputed papal election in Rome. Who's going? Who's who's the right bishop of Rome, and who solves the tiebreaker? But Theodoric, Theodoric the Amal, dude's an Ostrogoth king. He's a Homoian Arian. He is not Orthodox. He is not part of the same church as the bishop of Rome, and they get him because he's a neutral third party. They get him to adjudicate between the two claimants to the See of St. Peter, man. So it's clear, even in the West, even in the West where you're like, ah, I'm not so hot. I'm not so hot on, you know, the emperor doing stuff or the kings doing stuff. In, in uh, spiritual spheres, you still look to them um, because they are men who hold authority and they, men who hold power, men who have respect and autoritas and all of these things. And so you have all these all these things going on. I have the word the name Charlemagne is my notes. I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. And so this of course leads to this ongoing question which shifts and changes over time, but it is nevertheless uh in a Christian commonwealth, what is the monarch's role? And a tiebreaker at the least, one could almost feel um that you know the queen the queen is supposed to be helping um raise up true piety, religion, and virtue in, in her people, creating a state of peace and concord um, where true religion can flourish. And in the 16th century, that means making, making good selections for Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and, you know, perhaps in the 6th century, that means making good selection for Bishop of Rome, if you're Justinian. Because Vigilius, unfortunately, wasn't. Anyway, so that's all I really have to say about this for now. I think it's something that we need to think about, though, uh, not that I think that our democratically elected representatives should be getting involved in church politics, but that I think we need to think about the, what is the place of lay power in spiritual debate and what is, and what is our relationship with the things that went on in the past? Like does Constantine's inter interference in church politics abrogate the Council of Nicaea? No. Um, but these are things that we perhaps should be thinking more deeply on. And uh, just, just generally speaking, I'm probably getting close to about 30 minutes. So I'm going to finish this video here. But I look forward to seeing you on my next video next week. Catch you on the flip side.